First, some of you may have seen this, but imagine you're hired to create an application to uh, display uh, numbers, statistics from uh, marketing research. And uh, you created this application to show this to management. You know, management likes pie views and histograms and stuff like that. So here's your application. And you're almost done. But then they, the customers call you into a meeting. And they sit you down and they say that our management really likes your application. It's really cool. I mean, they get to see all the statistics in different ways. But the internal systems have made a change. So instead of having all this data in a file, they have now put it all into a database. So you have to rewrite your application a little bit. And they look at you and you go, hmm. Well, this means that I have to rewrite the whole back end of my application. And that's going to cost you a little bit of money because, I mean, it's not easy to just rip out the whole loading part and uh, replace it with uh, something that loads data from a database, right? So they say, OK, well, we have to do this. So you get paid, and uh, the, they give you time to do this. Now, when you get back to the office, all you do with your application is to replace a couple of lines of code, you know, rip out the back end, plug in a new back end, and you go home and enjoy your weekend with the kids and uh, your wife, right? Now, that is what, why we have the model view architecture in Qt, to give you this flexibility. So we want to look at how it's done. These are the different parts of the model view architecture, broadly speaking. First, we have the bottom one, the model. This is where you keep your data. This is also where you want to implement your business logic, how the data is manipulated and processed. Then you have this blue cube, the view. This is where you present the data in your application. Notice how we separated the data and the presentation of data into two different parts here. As you who are familiar with the model view controller design pattern, you, you know this from before. You know this whole data presentation separation. And it's the, the task of the model to tell the rest of the world when something in the data changes. We also have another part. Oh. Let me continue with the view, actually, because there are some, different, some important things here. I said that the view is responsible for presenting the data. That means that it's responsible for laying out the different items of data that you have. And it's responsible for implementing view-specific behavior. I mean, you have different views. You have, normally, you're familiar with things like tables and tree views and list views. And list views and tree views have different behavior. In a tree view, you can expand branches and things like that. That's what you implement in the view, naturally. We also have another part, the top part, the yellow sphere. That's the selections. We have separated out the selections, the selection state of the items into a separate part that you can share between views in the model view architecture. Last part is the red cone. The item delegate. This is the part that's, that comes the closest to the controller in the model view controller pattern. It is responsible for drawing single items in the views. It's also responsible for editing single items in the view. But it's all on a per item basis. This is how we used to do it in Q3. Basically, we took all this functionality that I just described, and we shoehorned it into single classes. You had one implementation for a tree view. We actually called it the list view in Q3. And we had all the functionality, the selection, the expanding of branches, the data was stored in the one class there. Everything was put together. And you have that here with three Widgets. And the thing is that 
in Qt4, you can still do that. We actually provide classes for you to do that because sometimes you don't care about being efficient. You don't care about this whole sharing business. You just want to display some data. You don't want to be aware of what's happening in the background. And that's OK. We provide this functionality for you also. And as Matthias said, if you want to just use your standard Q3 way of doing things, the Q3 support library is also there for you to use. It's also part of the API. So don't be scared. But we are talking about model view programming. And this is the way we do it when we use the model view architecture. As you see here, we have one model where all the data is stored. And here we have three views where we present the data. It could be in totally different ways, but it's the same data, essentially. And at the top, we have the selections. Here, we can actually share the selections between the views. So you can show that if you select an item in one view, you can also show it as selected in another view. And that's fairly useful. Here's the first piece of code. Um, I don't know if you can read it very well, but you can also refer to your handouts. There's a point to this. Uh, you don't have to understand all that's going on when I show you code. Just I'll point out the uh, important parts here. And here it is, just to show you how easy it is to share a model between views. Here we instantiate a directory model, a model that shows the file system. And we share it between two different views. In this case, it's a table view and a tree view. And as you can see, it's very easy to do. The result looks something like this. You can download the source afterwards and compile it and actually see that it works. Here we show it with different uh, views and different parts of the data. OK, the benefits of using model view architecture, the buzzword list, basically. The efficiency. What you gain with model view architecture is that you don't have to duplicate data. If you want to show a piece of data over different views, you don't have to copy it around. You don't have to make several instances and get the overhead of having items. I mean, items in Q3 and also in the convenience classes in Q4 have some overhead. They have virtual functions. They have some infrastructure that goes with them. And if you want to avoid this, if you want to be lean and mean, you can use small view architecture and just have your data structure. And that's it, practically. The flexibility. Since we have defined interfaces between the different parts, we can basically just rip one part out and plug one part in, as my initial example showed you. I mean, we can take the back end of an application, the, the part that stores the data, and we can say that, no, we want something else. Instead of showing the directory model, the, the file system, we want to show a, a list gotten that we get over the network. And what we do, basically, is to change the back end model to use a network-based model or something like that. You can also change views. You can change from using a list view to a tree view, or even a custom view that you write yourself that uses OpenGL to do fancy 3D effects. It's all possible to do. And then the maintainability. When you use the model view architecture, you naturally split up your applications into modules. And that makes the, the code easier to maintain. There's also one other factor. When you write your own model, for example, it's easier to test out your data initialization code, your structure, because you have a defined interface to work against. It's easy to create unit tests. You can test it on different views to make sure that it works. Or the other way around, if you write your own view, you can test it against a number of different models and make sure that it works fine. OK, introducing the model interface. Now, this is the part where we really dive into code. But don't be afraid if you don't understand all that's going on. I want to just highlight some important features. And you will have time to sit down and play with all this code yourself afterwards. First part, I want to show you how easy it is to actually instantiate your own custom model. 
it seems intimidating to do that yourself if you look at the API, but really, if you just want a minimal model to test out, it's fairly easy. You don't have to implement that much. In this case, we instantiate a list model, and we only have to re-implement two functions, the row count and the data function. And this is the implementation. It's like 15 lines of code or something. And all it does is to tell the rest of the world that I have 10,000 rows, and when you ask for data, I just generate something on the fly. In this case, it's a row count, or the, the number for the row that you're asking for. Could be anything. Another added benefit with this is that you don't store anything in this model. It takes up virtually no memory except for uh, what you use for a Q, Q object. So you have 10,000 items that take no memory at all. That is useful in many cases. And the result, if you show this model, is this. And as you can see, we had a list model, but I'm showing it in the table view. And there's a point to that. And this is it. I want to show you how we think about data structures in the model view architecture. As you can see here, we have a list, and list is really just a special case of a table, right? It's a table with just one column. So we have a list and a table, and they're basically the same structure. And then we have now covered two of the three main data structures that we use. We have the list view, we have the table view, but how do we handle hierarchies, trees? This is the way we think about trees. A tree is basically just a hierarchy of tables. In this case, actually a hierarchy of lists, as you would normally uh, know from you know, uh, computer science 101 or something like that. But we think of it as a hierarchy of tables, where each cell in a table can have another table of children. And as you can see, this is how we would show this hierarchy in a tree view. So, how do we get to the data in a model? We have to have some way of saying that I want this piece of data. For that, we use the model index object. The model index is a very lightweight, short-lived object that we use to indicate a position in a model. And the reason why we don't use a pointer or something like that is that you may not have the actual data in the model. The model may be using a data source on the other side of the network. It may, be, it may be generating the data on the fly, or it may even be tricky and say that I'm going to load a little bit of data, but I'm not going to load all of the data until somebody asks for it. So we can't pass around a pointer. But this gives an indication to the view where in the model the data exists. And the good thing is that we can take a model index, we can get it from the model, we can pass it around to the view or anybody else. It can move it around, like do layout of items or things like that, and when it needs the data, it passes it back to the model and says, now I'm ready for the data. Please give me the data for this position in the model. And that is what we see here on the second line here, where we ask for the model for the data. And what you can also see here is that we have something called a role. In this case, a display role. And a role is basically, let me start again. An item, it is not necessarily just one piece of data. Typically, an item consists of several pieces of data. In my case here, I have a pixel map that shows the icon. I have some text, but I also have a tooltip on my item. And that is why we have roles. We assign a role to each piece of data in an item. And the thing is that a role, a data role, doesn't have to be of a specific type. That is why it's not called a text role or a pixel map role, because the display role in this case can be something completely different. In this example, I have made the display role a Q color. So instead of a pixel map, I return a Q color and say, that's my icon. That, that's the main piece of information I want to show you. And the result when I show this is this, a nice collection of green items with some text. 
And now is actually a good time to talk about customized painting. I guess that a lot of you guys are interested in doing special painting for each item. And that is why we have the, the item delegate. With the item delegate, you can easily subclass it and implement special painting, special editing, things that you want to do that are not standard with the item views. And in this case, we have a color delegate where we want to handle the color a little bit uh, differently. So we re-implement the paint function. And this is a lot of code, but the important part here is that we take the data for the, the decoration role and we look at it and we say, if it's a color, we want to do something special with it. We don't just want to uh, paint the, the icon as green, for example. We want to do something special with the background. In this case, we want to paint a uh, gradient. And the result is something like this. It looks kind of pretty. Would be cooler if there were different colors, though. Second case, imagine we want to create a model that initially, or that in the end enables you, us to show data like this. Strings shown in black, uh, negative numbers in red, and positive numbers in blue. And we want to load all this data from a text file where the items are tab separated. And one last thing, we want to edit them. That adds a little bit of complexity. Now, since this is a table, we add another dimension. We need to tell the rest of the world how many columns are there in this table. So we have the column count. We also have, uh, since we want to edit this, we need to implement the set data function. And then a couple of uh, non-API functions for loading and saving. And this is the implementation of the data function. The one thing I want to call your attention, attention on is the edit role here. As you can see in this case, we don't care about the edit role at all. We don't make any difference between display role and edit role. But the, the point with the edit role is that when you want to differentiate between the value you see in the editor uh, and the value you normally display, you use the edit role. Imagine if you're creating something like a spreadsheet. Now, a spreadsheet can show you raw data like text or, or, uh, or numbers, but in some cases, the, you want to write formulas for, uh, for calculating things. And then you want to display the formula in the editor, but you want to display the calculated result in the actual spreadsheet when you're not editing. That is the role of the edit role here. That is why we have it. Now, the set data function. The one thing I want to point out here is actually marked with important. That is, when you do something in the model that makes the data change, you want to let the rest of the world know. The view has to know that it needs to repaint that particular item. The other users of the model may want to know when something has changed. So you have to emit the data changed signal. Second part here is the function at the bottom, the flags function. We need to let the, the delegate know that the items are actually editable. Sometimes you don't want items to be editable. Sometimes you don't want to let the, the view or the delegate open up editors on items. But in, mo in many cases, you, you need to let them know that it's OK. We want the user to be able to change this value. So you set the flag and return it. OK, the load function. The load function is really not a function that's part of the model interface. But I show you this because I want to show you uh, that data changed is not the only thing you can emit for, to let the world know that something's changed. In this case, we actually clear the whole model we rip out all the data and load new data, and the whole model changes. So everything is changed. 
the view can has to throw out anything like selections, states, editing. It has to just clear everything and start again. That is what the reset function is for. The reason why it's not a, a signal but a function is that the model has some internal bookkeeping for for helping with the selections uh, when things change. So if we need to let the model also know that something has changed. This is the result. And uh, when you get home, you can compile the example and see how it works. So the last part here, the part that I think is the most exciting, of course, because it's new stuff. Note that a lot of the things we talk about here is Qt 4.1 or even beyond. So we have defined a model interface. So what can we use it for? This is an example. We can actually stick another model in between the view and the model, as proxy model in this case. This opens up a lot of opportunities, a lot of things you can do. What springs to mind is things like processing the data that you're passing on. But you can do other stuff. Imagine that you can map the layout of the source model and change the layout to something completely different in the proxy model. And the view wouldn't know. The view only sees the, the proxy model. Excuse me. the cold I was talking about, sorry. <coughs> so we are mapping, and we can manipulate this mapping. So what can we do? We can do things like sorting. <coughs> we can basically move the sorting from the source model to the pro proximal. And as you notice that, you notice that in our table model, we didn't bother to Im <coughs> sorry, implement sorting. We simply ignored it. And the reason is that we ha already have mechanisms for sorting in form one. We have the sorting proximal. And this is the way you use it. Basically, you instantiate the sorting proximal you set the source model, <coughs> sorry, sorting proximal, sorry, you set the source model on the sorting proximal ad, and you set the sorter as the actual model that the view sees. The view doesn't know anything about the source model at all. All it sees is one model. And this is the result. Other things we can do with a mapping proximal, we can just ignore some some rows. We can say that I don't want to map you. I, I'll just ignore you, and <coughs> the result is that you filter away those rows. Okay, so this is how we use a filtering model. In this case, and this is actually in Qt 4.1, I use a string filter model. I connect it to a line edit, and I can filter the contents of the source model live by typing in the line edit. The line edit will send a signal every time the text has changed, and we will update the view with a new filtered content.
And the last thing I want to show you, and this is not in for one. This is aggregating models. We have a running prototype at Trolltech, and it will probably be a part of Qt 4.2. What it does is that it has several source models, and it presents them all to the view as one model. In this case, I aggregate a Q string list model with a Q dir model, so you will have a view of first a couple of strings and then the whole file system. And this is the result. So, what have we been through? I've shown, given you an overview of the Qt model view architecture. I've shown you all the bits and pieces and how they hang together. I've given you an introduction to the model interface and hopefully given you a, given you a stepping stone to creating your own model. And finally, I'll show you some of the possibilities of the defined model interface. There are several other things you can do with model view. I haven't shown you how to create your own custom view. That's very, very interesting to, for example, create your own 3D view. That's absolutely possible and something that we are playing around with internally in, in Trolltech. And here is some sources for further information about model view programming. And that actually concludes my talk, so I will be open for questions if we have any. Thank you. OK, so do anybody have a question for Marius? Hello, from, my name is Thomas Anders from Balco Orthogon. I'm more or less posing the same question as this morning. Will this um, MVC programming be integrated with the Canvas module? I mean, that's just where it would fit perfectly to have a model and, um, well, a 2D or possibly also a 3D uh, view of that. Are there intentions to go for that? There we go. Fine. Um, as Matthias said, internally in Trolltech, we have a prototype of uh, what we call a graphics view, which is basically the, the, in, the uh, descent, descender or the son of uh, Canvas. And it uses the model view architecture. Uh, whether or not the final product will use the model view architecture is still unsure, but it's definitely possible. And it's definitely something that we're looking into. So uh, I can't promise you uh, a, a graphics view that uses uh, model view, but it's definitely a possibility. Next question. Over there. OK, one moment. Uh, hi, Florian Link from Mavis. Um, I would be interested in custom editors. Is it, is it easy to do custom editors? Because we didn't speak about them. We have two mechanisms there. The first one and most immediate one that you uh, see if you, you, you look at the code is you can subclass an item delegate and just re-implement a function called create editor. And there you can create your own specialized editor. That's, that's the most immediate one. But we also have a mechanism that we call an editor factory that is the standard item delegate uses, where it can register a creator object for the, the factory, and it will create your special editor for a given type uh, or data type that we have in Q variants. So yes, uh, we have, uh, it's fairly easy to create your own editor. One thing I want to mention is that in 4.1, we also have uh, API for just adding widgets for uh, items. 
so directly in the view. So you can create your own widget and you can set it in the view without having to go through the item delegate to create uh, editors. Okay, next one more question. Uh, one more question to that. Uh, can you use custom types in the Q variant? I guess I can register custom types. You can register so custom types in Q variants, and uh, you can then look for them when you want to create your own editor if you want to. Great. That's absolutely possible. I think I saw some questions over there. Is that correct? There's one. Hello. I have one question about Spain. Uh, spanning columns and uh, rows, for example, in tables. Sorry, can you repeat? Spanning in QT3. Spanning items. Yeah. That is something we have on our list for uh, Qt4.2. It's, um, <clears throat> it's something that we postponed for uh, 4.0 and 4.1 because uh, we didn't hear requests for it. And uh, this is actually the first time I've heard customers asking for it after we've removed it. But it's something that's been planned all along. We are planning to do it for 4.2 now that we have all the frameworks in place and we can spend time filling out the holes and making the API more complete. So it's, it's coming. Was there a question in front here? This one. For JS development tools, why is the selection kept different from the model? Uh, the thing is that you may or may not want to have the same selection for several views. So if you integrate the selection into the model, then you, you can't have different selections for different views. If you separate out the selection mechanism, you can choose whether you want to share selections or keep separate selections in the views. Any more questions? There's you first and then behind. Okay, I am Aaron Stanik. Uh, I have a question. In QT3, you had QTable, and it was possible in QTable to uh, change the, the layout of the table a bit, of all the headers and the vertical headers, vertical headers. But is it also possible in the model model of QT4? Yes. Uh, there, it's possible to move columns and rows uh, in the header in table. The header view in uh, QTable view in Qt4 is now a standard header and it can move sections around, no problem. There have been some bugs, but it is in there and uh, it should be working now. Okay. Also one in the back here. Hello, my name is Man from 3G Softens and Measurement. Um, you showed us you can use a proxy uh, between the model and the view, uh, would it be possible to use several proxies? So you can use a filter and a sort proxy, for example. Yes, uh, there's nothing stopping you from doing that, except that naturally your performance will go down. Because every time you use a proxy, you add a layer of mapping. I mean, if you're just doing data processing, it's not too bad, but if you change the layout between each proxy model, you add another lookup in the QMAP or something similar, which naturally takes a little bit of time. So depending on the hardware and the way you do it, uh, you, you have to f find out for yourself how many layers of proxy models you can use. But technically, there's nothing stopping you from having 10 proxy models in a pipeline. It's just that it will be very slow. So, um, but yes, it's absolutely possible. Okay, any more questions? Hello, it's uh, Enrico Carrara from Rina. Uh, is there any plan for uh, uh, custom views? Yes. Um, <laughs> Just a few days ago, I sat down with a colleague of mine to list all the ideas we have for things going forward now from, uh, from uh, Qt 4.1 and what we want to do with item views. And one of the things we were looking were, uh, at were different views 
a better selection of views you can use on mobile. And uh, it's definitely something that's going to happen. What you will see probably is that you will have a broader selection of views and models released as solution packages because these things are ideal for as solutions. Uh, but we will try to incorporate a few different views in core Qt uh, to, to, to help you out with different things. So yeah, there will be more custom views. Uh, we still have some more time. Any more questions for Marius? There is one back there, is it? No. No more questions? Okay, then uh, give Marius a big applause. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Marius. Uh, there will be a break until 1,600 hours. In